It's my pleasure to uh, welcome to introduce um, Ahmed uh, Omer um, Omayon. Sorry, I'm trying to say your name correctly. <laughs> Omayon. Okay. Uh, so Ahmed actually he worked with me a, a few years ago. He worked with me as a summer intern. Um, I, I just showed him like, some of some of the slides he did before. He actually doesn't remember anymore, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. So. Yeah, actually, a couple of years ago, uh, I hired him to work on an intern project, with, uh, which was funded by um, Microsoft Store. Uh, they wanted to do a present hunting with Connect. So uh, he, he built this um, uh, two Connect uh, um, system with the, the two Connect sort of uh, uh, and ceiling and then mounted downwards. Uh, presumably, to look at the entrance of a store and then we do a present hunting and uh, do the tracking and detection, present hunting and detection from the, from the head of it. From the, the point of clouds, um, I think he did a really nice job there, and the marks the store people actually like it a lot. But uh, so it's kind of nice to have him back. And uh, after, since then, he has you have been working on actually mostly our GB based, not really uh, devs yes. anymore, right? Yes. Yeah, and, and uh, I just found out that actually the work he did was very closely related to what uh, we're interested in. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the, you can see the um, the title here. It's really related to like sort of uh, people. An object, object detection tracking from videos, and also he also works on incremental learning, which is something also very interesting. So I'm really excited to, um, so to uh, look forward, it's excited to see your talk, to, uh, to see what what stuff you have you have been doing at school, and also I I just learned that they, uh, he has just finished his thesis, he's officially now a doctor. Right? So next time I, when I I'm not si I'm sick. I'm going to see you. <laughs> okay. oh, no, I'm right. not that kind of doctor. <laughs> okay. Like everybody else. Here All right. Too. Nice. <laughs> all nice right. Nice. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the generous, uh, generous uh, introduction, Zicheng. Uh, yeah, it's really exciting to be back at MSR after a long time. I think it has been four years. I don't want to say that it has been four years, but I, <laughs> it seems like it. Uh, it hasn't been that long. But yeah, it's nice to be back. All right, so uh, yeah, so I will be talking about uh, the work I have been doing for my thesis. Um, I, do you guys mind if I move there or something? Uh, uh, yeah, so I've been working on this problem of detection and incremental object learning in videos, and uh, I'll be talking about both these parts today. <coughs> All right, so uh, the thing I've been thinking about over the last couple of years is this uh, is this idea that AI well. Uh, our machine learning algorithms are sort of working now, and uh, we should be thinking more about how do we put agents in uh, in the world, uh, which can actually deal with uh, you know learn about objects every day. And uh, so one key question or one key observation is that when an object is or an agent is in the world, uh, the typical input that it would be dealing with is uh, is videos. And more specifically, it would be a streaming video input, right? Uh, so it's not like a batch, right? As in you're not getting one image at a time or something. It's like a video stream. And uh, the question is, can you use that video stream in a way uh, to learn about the objects in your environment? All right. And the second thing I would like to say is that videos are interesting because it provides you a rich set of labeling in some sense. Uh, so you all know that if given images, what you all can get is like, let's say, segmentations in a single image or a bounding box in a single image. Uh, but what you cannot get, for instance, is like, how does the segmentation or the object deform or track over an object over time? Uh, secondly, I would say that it's a rich set of labeling in the sense that if it's an, it's an agent that interacts in the environment, so for instance, it comes in, picks up objects, and so on, uh, that in itself provides you a rich set of labeling. So it knows, the agent knows when did it pick up or put down an object, for instance. All right. Okay, so, uh, so now let, let's think a bit about how we are training our current models, uh, deep models, and where do we need to go for doing this object recognition in videos. Uh, which is more akin to how uh, children or people do it in their everyday environment. So uh, you all know that uh, we, the way we train our algorithms is we typically take a batch of samples, and most, all of them are labeled, typically. And then uh, it's fed into some learning algorithm, and you expect some set of labels that you know beforehand that this learning algorithm would be able to recognize. So, so you gave samples for recognizing giraffes, telephones, and whales. 
uh, and uh, feed this into a learning algorithm, and eventually it should be able to recognize all these categories. Uh, so I would say that's still a far shot from, from what we want to get, right? So, so how do infants or, or humans uh, have uh, when they are trying to recognize these objects over time? So of course, one major difference is that your human or infant or whatever is dealing with a streaming video input, right? So in comes like a set of frames, let's say, and then you've got to recognize uh, objects or detect objects or track them over time. Uh, the other major difference is that most of the times, children are receiving extremely sparse labeling, right? As in if uh, people who have children, or I guess you don't even need to have children, so to, to know this, that children rarely need to be told that, oh, look, Billy, this is a giraffe, right? Or this is a car, or so on. Uh, as, as compared to the number of samples they see for a giraffe or car. So that's another major difference, right? Uh, the third difference, I would say, is that not only you are giving the sparse labeling, but you are also want to increase your category set over time, right? So the child, every, every learning moment, it's maybe getting a new category, right? So, so Billy is being told about, let's say, uh, the whale, right? It's the first time it saw the whale, the parent told, oh, look, there's a whale, right? And not only that, it needs to grow that category set over time, right? Uh, and uh, the interesting thing to me is that when a child is born, it has no idea about the number of categories it would see over its lifetime, and it needs to learn about them. Or because it's a limited memory system, it needs to forget about some of those categories too, right? Because some of them are not necessary. All right, so, uh, so in this direction, I will propose, or I will show you basically two systems I've worked in. Uh, they are sort of disparate, but, but uh, uh, they, they try to tackle different portions of the problems I told you about. So the first algorithm I will tell you about is this, this supervised learning paradigm uh, for video object detection, right? So the, the goal here is that you will be getting multiple frames, so you will get a window of fixed set of frames. So let's say five frames. You feed this into a learning algorithm, and the goal is to detect a fixed set of categories, right? And I will show you a system which is uh, which I built over the last two years. It's able to localize, track, and identify objects. And it's uh, if you look at the tracking performance, it's like 10% better than a single image baseline. And it's uh, not only that; it's two and a half times faster. And this is much over real time now. All right. Uh, okay, so the second part of my talk I will talk about is this incremental learning of objects, uh, where what you get is basically uh, a stream of uh, video, uh, a stream, well, not a stream, but like uh, a couple of frames for different objects. So let's say this is a rotating object of something, this is a rotating object for something, and you're gonna feed this into a learning algorithm and I expect that it would be able to classify those set of objects over a good growing category set. And uh, so we were working with a developmental psychologist, so a lot of that work is uh, inspired by how in infants learn in their, in their environment. Uh, so, and the other thing is that we, I will talk about this self-directed learning paradigm that we, uh, we proposed recently. All right. By the way, I, I forgot to say, if you have questions, just stop me, and I'll, I'll try to answer them. And there's also a Q&A at the end. All right, so I'll, I'll use this slide as the layout to my talk. So I talked about two, two parts, real-time video object detection and this incremental object learning. So let's just uh, jump right into it. Uh, right, let's talk about the real-time video object detection. So, uh, so when I set out to do this work, uh, my goal, or or what I was really seeing in, in uh, Vision was that over the couple of years after Foster RCNN or Fast RCNN, we have gotten really good at using appearance of in images for detecting objects. But the interesting part is that we haven't been using any systems, most of the systems that we are building are not using the motion features for recognizing objects. And the interesting part is like, if you look at uh, human perception, 
uh, we are very good at perceiving what object there is by just looking at motion patterns. So there's this really interesting work by Niloy Mitra uh, on emerging images. I think if you have seen the Dalmatian uh, image uh, by, I guess, uh, I, I forgot the name. Uh, but uh, there's this famous Dalmatian image where you, by the concept of emergence, you see the Dalmatian if you look carefully. Uh, and this is very similar. So, so right now in the left side, you hardly can tell what there is. But as soon as I start playing the video, it will become very apparent what thing there is, right? So, so the interesting part is like, mostly you are using your, cap your ability to do uh, some sort of correspondence in time and uh, to detect and, and recognize that there's a person going around the scene. And then there are these really old Johansson's experiments, which are really interesting. So by just seeing a couple of, the motion of a couple of dots in time, uh, you are able to recognize what is happening. So, so I guess this is some sort of tango or whatever, some, some dance, right? And you can clearly say that there are two people. And people are really amazing at this task. Like they can even say like, oh, there, that's a woman or that's a man and they are holding some bag in their left hand and so on. So that's really interesting. And I think that is tip very, very much lacking in the vision research we are doing. We are not looking at motion more or less. So my goal in this, uh, in this work was to develop both, basically use both appearance and motion features for uh, recognizing objects. All right. Okay, so here's the pipeline. Uh, like everybody else in our field, we are gonna use a convolutional neural network. Um, and, uh, and there would be a fixed set of frames that are going to be fed into a convolutional neural network. And your expected output is a detection, a detection output over those set of frames. Right. Uh, any questions till now? Okay. Did you just say that one by one or it is uh, thrown into the network? The yes, so, so exactly. So, so the question is that, uh, the frame, are the frames fed into the network one by one, or is it like a group of frames that are fed into the network? So it's basically a group of frames that are fed completely into the network. Yeah. So from your previous uh, slides, you're talking about the motion, you use the motion trying to uh, classify the object. Right. So is that the intuition is different categories of the object has different type of motion, right. or from this motion, you can infer the shape of the object, and that gives you the clue to classify the object. So which way you think the I, SC, SC? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good question. I think uh, the answer is uh, partly both, right? As in, you are, when you see the motion of object, first you, uh, you so, so there's this big, uh, big field in vision also which can do motion segmentation. So it helps you segment out objects. Not only that, I would argue that uh, at times by looking at just the motion of the object, as I showed you before, you can also recognize objects. So for instance, think of a case where you're standing in a building and far away you can see, let's say some animal walking, right? So uh, you are not able to recognize whether it's a dog or a cat, but maybe by looking at the motion of that thing, you can recognize more uh, better that whether it's a dog or a cat. So yeah, so partly it's, it's basically both. Yeah, go ahead. So you mean supervise the video object detection. So it means in every single input is a video. So you have the bounding box, you have ground truth, right? Right, right, right. Yes. If it is a so, single in, image input, the input channel is three. Normally it is RGB, right? But in this case, if it is five images, that means right. the, the input channel is 15? Let, 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 let me get to that. I, I'm going to talk about that next. Uh, okay, before I jump into it, uh, let me uh, nod to some of the works in video object detection which are happening right now. There's this famous, uh, there's this uh, a lot of work by Kai Kang's uh, by Kai Kang uh, for using these image level features uh, for doing detection, and then they fuse, do some sort of late fusion to do detection over time. And then uh, recently there was this uh, Christoph and Zissman's paper, which basically do, does develop these, uh, uh, these uh, spatial features and then uses a correlation filters over multiple frames 
with a tracking loss to produce some out, uh, to improve the detection output over every frame. Uh, I think the thing that is more close to my work is uh, this uh, paper by by Facebook, uh, which is doing which is doing poses rather than detections. But the idea is pretty similar that uh, you take multiple frames and you're expecting pose outputs over those multiple frames. And there's this idea of spatial space time anchors, which I will talk about. And uh, similarly, in the activity, uh, activity recognition domain, there's uh, this paper by Mubarak Shah, uh, which is also doing activity detection over, over these uh, uh, windows of frames and then patching them, uh, then uh, doing bipartite matching over, over multiple windows. All right, okay, here we go. I, I think this would uh, hopefully answer your question. So, so let, me, let me talk about the network or the algorithm, the network I built. Uh, let's start with a 2D ResNet 34. I think most of you are aware of ResNet 34. So the way to read this is that these uh, trapezoids, I think, yeah, these trapezoids, um, are, are basically a group of convolutions, a batch norm and a ReLU and a highway connection. And uh, there's a feature map that is produced after the set of uh, <coughs> convolutions. So this, is, uh, so this is con block one, this is con block two, and so on, right? And these are the outputs after each con block. So this is the output for con block four. Uh, and at the bottom, you will see the feature map output uh, in the number of frames. So since this is a single image uh, uh, pipeline, each feature map is just a single frame output, right? All right, so, so let's expand that to a 3D convolutional neural network. So what you are doing is that basically you are receiving a bunch of frames, let's say five frames right now. And in the network, at particular places, uh, you will insert these 3D convolutions. And I would donate, uh, donate, uh, denote them by, by, red, uh, by red trapezoids. So what is happening is that in the con, before con block three, you can think of it like a 2D convolutional network where now you have all five frame features as you go, got to con block two. But now let's say you want to compute some motion feature. Uh, let, let me finish this point. Yeah, so let's say you want to compute some motion feature as you're going along, right? So, so you can insert a, a three by three by three convolu 3D convolution uh, where the temporal stride is one and there is no padding. So, so if you have five frames, those would become a th three frames after that 3D convolution. And similarly, you can once you have three frames, if you apply a three by uh, a three filter depth in the time dimension, it will collapse it to one frame. But the idea is that these three D convolutions are learning some spatiotemporal uh, spatiotemporal features uh, to compute on your input uh, input set of frames. Sorry, go ahead. No, uh, so you know, uh, if you look at the filters for these uh, you know frames, they're they're going to be learning the same thing, right? So isn't there like an explosion of filters to basically do the same thing? If you look at your first uh, 64 by uh, 5 by 150, so, all, so you are basically multiplying the 64 filters five times, and most of them are looking at images which are more or less the same. Right, that is true. So is there any over-parameterization problems you have? Uh, so, so, so you can, so the thing is like the number of parameters still now is exactly the same there is no change in number of parameters from a 2D convolutional network. Uh, the reason why I say that is that you can take a three by three filter, which is of spatial, uh, uh, which, is of, uh, which it lives in spatial domain, and then just add a one dimension thing to the, to the temporal channel, right? So it becomes a one by three by three filter. And then basically it's just being applied to every frame. So by this point, you can imagine that you took every frame and applied the same 2D convolutional network, okay. right? But after that, you are applying like a 3D convolution, so to collapse the uh, temporal information. All right, so uh, you can train more models by, so let's say if you increase the number of frames, you can add more 3D convolutions uh, to collapse that temporal information as you go down the network, right? 
but the point is, uh, one point I would like to say is that by con block five, all uh, temporal information has been collapsed to uh, one temporal depth. And, and there's, uh, there's practical reasons for it. I'll, I'll let you know uh, when I get to the results part. All right, so, uh, so the nice thing about this, I think other people have tried this, is that you can use a pre-trained image net and uh, use that as pre-training for your 3D convolutional ne neural network. But then the question is, what do you do for these three by three by three filters, right? So there's a very simple thing you can do. It's called inflation. Uh, uh, so a nod to basically Rao Carrera and uh, Andrew Zissiman, uh, which introduced this inflation method, which basically just replicates the filter in time and just divides them by, let's say, by three here. And the effect that has is that if you have the same input over time, the output would also be exactly the same. All right. Okay. So. So you might ask, well, why, why, am I, why aren't you using more 3D convolution, right? So, so I did try this, and empirically I found that uh, typically you can collapse that at the start of these con blocks, and it works as well as uh, inserting more 3D convolutions. And uh, I think that part of the reason is that as you increase, include more 3D convolution, basically you are over pattern pricing the network, which is good, but uh, as we have seen, like in other methods, like over parameterization of networks is a good thing. But I think what really happens is that I am really lacking data here. And, I, and I'll talk about that at the end too. And you're basically increasing the number of parameters, but the, but the, but the amount of data has remained the same. So I think it's not really being used in, the, in more filters. So, <coughs> Go ahead, Ian Ping. Well, this one, I have to think about another reason, which is, to recognize an object, you don't need a long time. Only short period of time is good enough for you to recognize the object. Right. So when you have more 3D convolutions, basically your reception field over time is very long. Yeah. And is that necessary for that long series right. to? Right, so, so yes, there are arguments that uh, you, you can take really short snippets in time and recognize the object. In fact, the Johansson experiments I was showing at the start, uh, they did even experiments where people are shown, like those uh, point dot things, people are shown that clip for a quarter of a second and they're able to recognize what is happening. So even in humans, you can argue that a very short time period motion is good enough for recognizing objects. All right, okay, so uh, now that we have that base, uh, base network, uh, which is collapsed to one filter, uh, one temporal filter channel, you can take that and build an SSD style pipeline on top of it where each feature map is gonna make some prediction at a different scale for detections. Uh, by that, what I mean is, let's say I take uh, one of these uh, feature maps, which is a 10 by 10 uh, feature map, and at every location in that 10 by 10 uh, map, there are multiple anchors which are making detection predictions. So it's like a standard SSD pipeline. Uh, so in this case, where there are 10 by 10 feature maps and there are N anchors at each location, you will get uh, 100N possible detections from that feature map. All right. So uh, it's a detection pipeline, so every feature map would be making localization and classification predictions. And classification here is C plus one because you also need to find whether it's a background or not. All right, okay, so, uh, so the, I talked about this idea of anchors and uh, the thing is, uh, so let me just refresh people's memories about spatial anchors, it's pretty straightforward, you take, uh, Basically, at every location which is associated to an anchor, you're trying to predict an offset from that anchor for localization, right? So you want to localize the squirrel, and you have this anchor in purple. Uh, rather than predicting the actual bounding box, you are predicting an offset from the anchor, right? So why is that useful? The, there are a couple of reasons. Firstly, it when you divide the prediction over multiple anchors, you make the prob uh, learning problem easier. Because 
each predictor is then only predicting localizations for a certain sort, uh, certain sort of uh, uh, certain priors of anchors, right? Uh, so this anchor would not be making predictions for a very long object, for instance, right? So if there's a person, it would fall in another anchor, right? All right, and and of course, uh, just to remind you, uh, during training, each ground truth is matched to multiple anchors by using an overlap measure. All right, so how do you extend that over time? It's, uh, you might have guessed it, it's very straightforward. Uh, you got uh, multiple frames coming in. Now, now you can take an anchor, a spatial anchor, and just extend it in time, right? Go ahead, Yinbang. So your ground truth is a cube or is a tube? It's a tube. Cube or cube? Uh, the, ground, the ground truth is, is a, you can think of it like a volume that is flowing in time. Okay, right. So, so like here, you can see that the squirrel's bounding box is flowing over time, right? And the anchor is just a rectangular anchor over time, and uh, that is a problem which I will talk about later. Uh, so now your anchors are spanning over all the fra input frames, right? Uh, and uh, the loss you are, the localization loss you're regressing to is just uh, trying to find the bounding box, the L2 norm for that bounding box to that anchor in every frame. And uh, since now we are dealing with videos, uh, each during training, each ground truth is mapped to an anchor using a volumetric IAU. All right. Okay, so uh, going back, so, so given this architecture, you can build a, a pipeline which takes in multiple frames and produces detections over all those frames. So, uh, so now what we need to, so let, let me tell you about some of the results. Okay, so before I jump into the results, so one thing I would like to say is that most of the pipelines are, which are built on single images make use of image data sets to improve their performance too. But of course, when you have a model which is inherently taking uh, multiple frames, how do you make use of those images? Uh, this is a simple hack you can do. Uh, you can take an ImageNet, uh, let's say you take images from ImageNet detection, and uh, for each image, you just replicate them in time, and you are trying to just mimic some translational camera path over those frames, and that becomes just the cropping region for that frame. So, so once you have found the cropping region, you crop all the images by that, and you uh, adjust your annotations accordingly. So that brings a big uh, performance benefit, and that's only because ImageNet video detection data set is not enough to do classification. Uh, I think like it's, it's not enough to generalize the classification on their validation set. So it's useful to use ImageNet detection data set. So you, you actually do not modify the images at all? The other same no. images? You just only ship the binding boxes? Yes. Well, so, so you take the image, right? And you replicate that in time. Same image. Same image, okay. exactly same image. Nothing, I've not changed any, <laughs> well, yeah, so I've not changed anything yeah. apart from maybe doing augmentations, which are like color augmentations, but the same augmentation yeah. is applied to all the sure, images, sure. yeah. Okay. I, mean, I thought you, you might uh, crop the object out and move the object in the image to, to create this sensation, so there's a yeah, simulation of the, of the, so you of the object and move Move objects. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But then you would always get this problem that if you're moving the pixels of the I, object, I, 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 then, yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to handle those. Yeah, yeah, I, no, no, I'm, I'm not doing anything fancy like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then you would get into these problems of in painting or something. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So why do the state augmentation, so you, the shift and the scale must follow some distribution, right? So what kind of distribution are you using? Um, you mean the ones for the cropping? Itself? So this one basically you use an image to generate a fake video and uh, based right. on the data augmentation, right? Right. So that from the uh, pr consecutive frames and the shift and the zoom must follow some distribution, right? It's a Gaussian distribution or Laplacian distribution, so what kind of distribution right. do you so, use? So I think it really depends on the cropping that you're applying to these images, but I don't think it, it matters too much. So the way I do it is I take an ImageNet video sample right? And it has some, so you take some object track, right? And this is like a hack, it's, it's nothing principled. So, so you just take some object track from ImageNet video data set, 
and use those bounding boxes to do the cropping in your image. Oh, I see. I see. So it's so it's the same distribution that would be generated by the tracks that you get out of ImageNet Video. And uh, I can tell you that distribution is very, uh, uh, very much centered around the center of the frame and not too much motion also. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, okay, so the other problem I was thinking about is that uh, you can imagine that I have increased the input complexity to the model, which is I'm now giving it multiple frames, right? And I've also increased the output complexity of the model, right? So I'm expecting it to do localization prediction over multiple frames. But what has not changed is the data that is available for training image models or video models in some sense, right? So one thing I wanted to try is let's say I only, so given multiple frames, let's say I want to only predict detections over the middle frame. Is that, is that correct? Okay. All right. So. So here, uh, in the standard model, you have five frames coming in. I want localizations, basically detections over all those five frames. Uh, uh, and in the middle frame prediction, I have five frames, and I'm going to only predict uh, the detections over the middle third frame. All right. So I will be showing results for both those models. OK, so here's the sad story. So. Uh, and, the, and, and by the way, I was really disappointed seeing this too. So, so if you're disappointed, I, I understand why you're disappointed. So, okay. So what you're seeing here is the mean average precision uh, against the number of input frames that the model was trained for. So one is the single frame baseline. And uh, as you go down, I'm basically increasing the number of frames as you input to the model. Uh, the sad story is, and uh, I'm still very sad about it, but I'm trying to improve it, but is that when you give three frames, uh, you see some improvement in performance, but it's not too large, right? As in it's a, within a one mean average precision point. And uh, one other thing is that typically when you're looking for detection performance per frame, uh, what is typically better is uh, the middle frame detector. And as you increase the number of frames, uh, the performance goes down. And I can say this, that one major reason that the performance goes down is that the detectors aren't able to say whether a certain anchor is an object. Uh, so it's not able to do the objectness measure that well as you increase the number of frames. And the reason for that is uh, it's, a, it's a very simple thought experiment to do. That let's say it was not seven frames, it was 100 frames, let's say. So the anchor lasts for 100 frames. Now, think of an object in the 100 frames. So as you increase the number of frames, you will be able to see more motion for that object, right? So now what can happen is that an object can fall in and out of that anchor. So you're looking at this temporal tube or uh, temporal receptive field, and the network is trying to make a decision whether it's an object or not. But if the object keeps moving in and out, or or it's or there's more clutter in the in the same receptive field, which can happen as you increase the number of frames. The performance of objectness does go down. The other the interesting thing is that the localization performance does not drop. So you are able to do very good localization even up till seven frames. And uh, uh, I, I'll get back to that, but but. The nice thing is that if you look at the performance as compared to the speed of these models, that's a more interesting story. So, uh, so I would say like a three frame bar input and three frame output standard model is slightly better than a single frame model, but it's much faster. And the reason for the speed gain is basically that you, you took all the temporal information and collapsed it by the conf block five, right? Whereas, uh, whereas the single frame detector, it has to look at the perf it has to compute features all the way for all the frames to make detections. All right. Okay. So, so that's what I said. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, go ahead. Uh, the three frame also look at all the frames, right? Sorry. Go ahead. I mean, how do you move the window of these three frames? Your... Right. That's that's a. That's a good question, and I'll ask, answer that in the next slide. Uh, it's, it's, uh, but, but you had a question too. Uh, 
Oh, uh, I yeah, guess again, somebody had a question. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So for the three frame input, three frame output, yeah. the way you calculate frames per second is you look at what was the time for this particular three frame input, three frame output, and you multiply that by three because basically you are doing three frame output, right? Uh, because the number is frames per second, and because right. the program is outputting three frame output, you look at the time, so time is, you know, 300 seconds, you say, okay. Or, or another way to say it is that you get a video, and uh, so the way this number is computed, I can give you more details. So, so the way you, uh, you get a video, right? And your goal is to compute detections over all those frames, right? Now, what you can do is maximize the GPU memory and fit as many frames in a batch as possible. And then basically, uh, so, so of course, a three frame input, you that model would occupy more memory, right? So, so that's fine. So the number of batches each model is taking in is different, but you're trying to maximize the GPU memory. So I'm just computing, let's say you got T frame videos, how much time do you take to compute the detections over all those frames, right? So, so let's say it took 1,000 seconds and you had uh, T frames, so basically, it is t by thousand, right? So in, in that case, uh, did you, uh, for single frame prediction, did mm -hmm. you uh, use the batch mode to uh, yes. do the prediction? Yes. So I've tried both things. So uh, I have tried taking batches in a way which maximizes GPU memory, and I also compared timing by forcing the network to only take a batch size of one. So in both cases, like the model that I'm showing here, or all the models which are, the standard models are faster than single frame models. And clearly the reason is that you are doing much less, comp well, you are doing definitely much less computation than a single frame model, or, or these models which are producing three frame input, one frame output. All right, just to answer your question, I think uh, this would become clear uh, when I talk about this. So. So now, now that you have detection outputs over these time windows, you want to create tracks, right? And I did the simplest possible thing, uh, which is basically taking these, uh, these detections so you get bounding boxes, right, over time. And now you want to do correspondence over different time windows. So, so let's say you got a detection in time window one, detection in time window two, and so on you want to do bipartite matching over these time windows. And the way I do bipartite matching is take the bounding box in the last frame of time window one and in the first frame of time window two and just do an IU metric, which becomes the, I, uh, the matching score. And uh, I do some other uh, simple tricks. Uh, and, and the thing is like, I'm doing this for all models. So, so both for single frame models and for multiple frame models. So uh, the question was that what would I, what is the stride of your time window, right? So, so if in a single frame model, the stride would be one. So every time window, I would compute the detection output and try to do bipartite matching over uh, consecutive frames. Over a multi-frame model, the, so let's say a seven frame input, seven frame output, the stride would be seven frames, right? So you move the detector, uh, the, the neural network forward by seven frames, and once you have outputs from consecutive seven frames, you can do bipartite matching so between them. So you two modes, right? You said one mode, you do the middle frame every... Right. So, so, so for the middle frame models, the, the stride is one. Okay. So it's right. going to be much more expensive, right, in that case? It's going to be much more, sorry? Because you have a batch, you have a batch of seven frames. Uh, right. It, and it's slower, right? Because, like, uh, as you saw here, so speed up. Uh, which version are you talking about? This? Right. So the speed up is for the three frame input, three frame output, or five frame input. Five. Frame. That is kind of strange, right? Because you, your network is in fact the more like have more parameters, right? Than the than the single frame one. You you put like a, several like a three D convolution in there. Right. And it's and not you, basically you do all the all the frames, right? You don't you don't do fewer frames. So why that, that, that is true, but, but I think the number of parameters, so my basic ResNet 34 single frame model has about 28 million parameters or 27 million parameters, 
But when you increase, include more 3D convolutions, it goes up to like 32 million parameters, not more than that. So it's not way more parameters. Because the reason for that is I'm only inserting like 3D convolutions very sparsely in my network. Yeah, my question is, uh, you have more parameters since it's faster, why? Right, so, so it has more parameters, but if you look at the multiply at compute uh, complexity, it's not more because by some part of the network, you have collapsed your temporal channels, right? So by the end of the base, base network, the temporal channels have been collapsed all to one, right? And after that, you are just, you can think of it like a 2D convolutional network after that. So it's faster and you're computing answers for all the seven input frames there. Okay. Right, go ahead. Yeah. So you are doing some frames in, some frames out, yep. and you're getting a performance increase as far as speed is concerned. Right. Uh, but it looks like you're getting an accuracy decrease. Right. And now you're telling me that, and so then, then your stride of time is you know, basically the number of frames you have. So in this case, the time stride is going to be seven frames. Right. Uh, and you're using the detection, or the, the output from the previous uh, seven frames to sort of see the input <coughs> of the next seven frames, or at least for the bipartite matching, do, do the matching. Just to do matching, yes. Right, but so now you have uh, a less accurate uh, output from one time window, and you have a less accurate output from time window two, and then you're trying to combine them together, wouldn't it? Then not that sort of drive the performance of accuracy down even more? It does. Uh, so why, why do it? Right, so, so let me show you the tracking part, because I have tracking results too. So. All right, so this, this, this. Okay, just to, just to cover the tracking performance, so, uh, sorry, just to, just to make some things clear. So for instance, uh, it's a detector, so there are multiple categories, and when you're doing bipartite matching, you're only matching between, the, between each category. That makes sense. So that basically naturally ends tracks, like tracks die and tracks are born over time. All right, okay. so. Here is the performance of, of, of the same set of models when you're doing tracking. So, uh, so you got single frame models and uh, what you are now seeing actually is that uh, the three frame, the standard models in tracking performance are actually better than the middle frame prediction models. As you remember in the previous graph, uh, the middle frame prediction models were actually better in mean average precision, but now that has been flipped. And the reason for that is that uh, what I've seen is that, uh, in, for instance, in this three frame model, uh, which is producing output over three frames, the correspondence done by the network itself is slightly better than the correspondence done by bipartite matching. So, so you are seeing that consistently over time. So, so the nice story is that uh, for a three-frame input, three-frame output, uh, the performance increase uh, okay, is about 10% from a single-frame model. Uh, all right, and uh, similar story. So, so it's, way up, it's about 75 or about 70 frames per second for three-frame input, three-frame output. And it's 10 times better, 10% better than a single frame model. All right, so, all right, so here are some results. Uh, on the left side, you will always see a single frame model. And on the right side, you will see uh, uh, the, one of the models that I've trained. And one thing you would see is that uh, if it's the same color, it's the color is basically denoting the track and you would be able to see the category and, uh, and uh, basically the, the confidence of the classifier as you go along. All right, so, so I'll let this play while I catch my breath. So one interesting thing you would see is that, uh, so sometimes the single frame model is, not, is confused at some moments. But uh, due to the motion of objects, uh, the multi-frame detector is able to catch that. Another thing you would see now is that, uh, right, as in the single frame detector is running at every frame, so it's not smoothing its predictions over time, so it can lose detections over time. So it will create a new track for that bus, whereas the multi-frame detector kept that track. Uh, what kind of 
kind of the effect that they use for that single effect. It looks much worse than. <laughs> So, so it's exactly the same model. So it's it's a ResNet 34 that I described initially. And it's so, detector, what kind of detector do you use? What kind of detector? It's yes. it's the ResNet 34 model built with SSD pipeline. SSD. Right. So so this is the same model that I explained at the start. And uh, single frame models sometimes. This is a cherry picked example. I I know, but sometimes when it's looking for Single frames, it makes like these spurious false positives, uh, whereas the multi-frame detector is not doing that. All right. Uh, what you will notice is that there would be a whale coming out. The, the multi-frame detector is able to actually capture it much earlier than, a uh, couple of frames earlier than the single frame model. Um, and whale is lost. And I think it will actually not get that track for a long, long time but the multi-frame detector is able to keep track of that until it sort of submerges. Yeah, okay, it also loses track. Okay, uh, this is a much harder example. The horse would get occluded, uh, so here. But what I'm trying to see is whether you're able to detect that thing, how long can you detect that thing uh, and keep a track of it over time. Uh, I think at some point the single frame detector would lose lose that detection and it will start a new track. All right. By the way, when you see this flicker and it's still able to keep track, it's only because I'm allowing all models to miss detections over I think two miss two detections consecutive detections and still maintain that track. Um, all right, spurious detections over both detectors. Uh, all right, I think that's the end so of So you, you mentioned it's a tracking, but why is single frame? You, even, even though you lose it, you can track, you can fill out the gap, right, using a tracker. Yes, why, why and I'm doing that. Why does your tracker still lose the object? Why? Right, so, so there are multiple reasons, like as in, uh, so for instance, one reason is that um, the detector's confidence sometimes drops a lot in a single frame detector. And uh, the detector's confidence. So, so when it drops, then I'm basically thresholding at a, an ID. So I'm also optimizing for the confidence level that I'm thresholding. So I'm optimizing that for each individual detector. So I'm trying to keep everything as fair as possible. Uh, but when it loses detections over much longer time periods in the single frame detector, that track is scaled over time too. Sometimes you show the tracking result with three frame detector, and sometimes you show five frame detector. Yes. Is that a cherry pick or? You... It's it's more of cherry. Pick. <laughs> yes. But but that said, like I was showing you the performance benefit, like as in in a three frame detector, three frame output model, yeah, yeah. Uh, tracking performance is definitely better than a yeah, so single. Yeah. So based on the, uh, the the final accuracy, it looked like the three frame detector performed better. Mm -hmm. And but uh, uh, I remember you actually uh, performed the three D uh, convolutional filter. So when when you have three frame. Uh, Three frame, uh, frames, then how can the 3D uh, convolutional filter uh, take effect exactly? Right, so there I think the three frame, so in come three frames, right? And let's say you have a single 3D convolutional filter, which is three by three by three. Mm -hmm. uh, it will try to learn some spatial temporal filter over those three, three frames. But it's in some sense, it's just moving spatially around those three frames, right? But if you have five frames, then you're, it's also moving temporally, right? A three frame, uh, three, frame three by three by three. Uh, yeah, when, when, you, when you only have three frames, I, I think the temporal uh, convolution uh, doesn't take uh, a lot of impact in that case. Right, so, so I think you, what... You, you don't really uh, learn the motion. Uh, in that, right, I, I totally agree. Yeah. As in there is not much motion in three frames also, yeah. right? But I think what is happening is that, and it's also true when you look at other papers in this field, is that if you can fuse information somehow, mm -hmm. so let's say there is motion blur in one frame, right? But there's not motion yeah, blur. I, I agree, multiple frames can give you some fueling information. Yeah. That, that should be better than yeah. the single so, frame. But, yeah. 
Yes, but motion, uh, I think it's quite difficult to learn motion from very few number of I, I agree. As in the, so let me get to my conclusion okay. slide. I think I will, I will talk about this. So, so okay, so I just talked about this. Okay, so one bad thing about this model is that 3D convolutional filters, the way I'm training it, is harder because just because I require much more GPU memory to maintain like, uh, so I require way more GPUs to maintain like a certain batch size, which is important if I have batch norms in my network. Uh, so I talked about the objectness. Uh, data is definitely an issue, as in if you look at ImageNet video, there are only 4,000 videos. So you can imagine like the, the amount of motion, uh, different motions that are there in 4,000 videos is not much. Uh, and uh, not only that, these, each of these 4,000 videos are about on average 10 seconds long. So it's not too much data. So, so something needs to be done here too. Uh, the other thing I would say, I think I talked about it a bit before, is that uh, current GPU, when you're training a multi-frame model, even though the number of parameters does not increase, but since the number of input the input size is increasing in the number of frames, the GPU occupies way more memory, right? So as you increase the number of frames, it becomes really infeasible to even keep them for training in your GPU. All right, so let's let's go forward. Okay, I finally got to my incremental learning part. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, you motivated this first part with that uh, Dalmatian kind of uh, video yeah. where each individual frame had nothing, it was indistinguishable from just noise. Right. You only saw the, the thing when you split multiple frames. So I was thinking that you're setting us up for an experiment where you would detect uh, you know, the images there, whereas the yes. individual single frame guy would just completely fail. But you did, I mean, you didn't show that experiment, so did you try something like that? Somehow you showed, you, you, you chose simple, e easy examples where you know, a human being can certainly detect perfectly even an individual frame. Right. Yeah, I, I, I do succeed to that point. I have not tried that yet. Um, do you think it would work? Um, well, it all depends. Like, it's a supervised pipeline, right? So if there is training data to train for such things, maybe it would work, but I cannot really say. Because in the example, the Nilo and Mithras paper I was seeing, uh, showing you, uh, the correspondence is also pretty tough there. Because like those patches from one frame to another are also moving. So the way they generate it, is as you're moving along, let's say there are patches over you, but even those patches are getting flipped from one frame to the next. But uh, it's an interesting experiment. I have not tried. I, uh, I would like to try such things. But, but the problem is like with this, this model I've seen, like definitely you need more data to train it. And on top of that, I would also say that it's important to learn some sort of temporal equivariance so the feature representation right now is not temporally equivalent. By, the, by that, what I mean is that, let's say you slow down or speed up an object's motion, right? In the current model, it would need to learn separate filters for them, right? Or as the motion, if you're going left or right, you would need to learn separate models. So I think there is, there is room for building like a temporally equivariant model where you have to actually look at how the con net can learn like a temporally equivariant uh, feature. So it's possible that it does not work in the example that I showed at the start. Right? Yeah, Yenpin. So have you tried to align the uh, object per frame, make them <laughs> center together, and uh, to prevent to learn the translation uh, motions? No, I have not. Uh, so, do you think I'll align them together then will... Uh... Right, so, so the reason why I did not try it is that, so even if you line it up, right, eventually you cannot put that constraint over your input, right? So you still need to do some sort of motion correspondence over time, right? So maybe that improves stuff, but then I also, I'm thinking like what is the what is the value of that in some sense, right? The reason so, I'm saying that, the human beings do something like that, right? So, right. for example, you track an object moving, <coughs> and you will, visually, in your mind, you will align, line up them together. Right. And uh, so, 
and and that's exactly what I was speaking about. Like I think you should be building some model which is sem somewhat temporally equivariant, right? So if there's a motion going left or right or something, you want to basically build a feature which removes that information, right? Well, removes it in the sense that the feature representation that's coming out of it does not take, uh, ignores whether the motion was left or right, but keeps it in the sense that you still want to do localization later on. Right. Okay, uh, let me go over this incremental learning part. Uh, so uh, for this part, I, we were collaborating with Dr. Linda Smith, who's a famous developmental psychologist at Indiana University. She is uh, famous for doing these uh, experiments where they build in, uh, bring in children while, uh, and put, uh, I think it's slightly bad for children, but she puts like a GoPro or, or Loxy cameras on their head so you can see the visual characteristics of their environment as they play in this toy setting, right? And there's, there's typically a, a caregiver with them which is interacting with them. So you get videos like this, right? So there's a mother with this child and uh, the mother would say at times, like, look, Billy, there's a hammer. Why don't you play with it or something, right? So the point is, like, the name of objects is given to, to the children at times, right? So now, now the child would hold the hammer, would rotate it, uh, sometimes put it in their mouths and so on, and uh, that would, uh, that basically allows them to learn about the visual characteristics of objects and sometimes associate names to those objects. All right, so, so given this paradigm, uh, I wanted to see whether we can do some sort of similar infant visual learning in the models we are building. So to way to, one way to set up this problem is that let's say uh, you have a time sequence where at each instance in time, you are receiving like a different object, right? But what you can also see is like you, uh, the child can pick uh, a different object in time, uh, uh, an object again, right? So object three was picked up again here. Uh, one thing important to note here is that the learner always knows that inside this time instance, this, it is going to be exactly the same object. And the other thing that the learner knows is that between two objects, uh, there's a pick up, pick, put down event, right? So the child put down the object and picked up another one, right? So that's another learning signal for them. So for each learning exposure, I said, uh, the child is gonna play with, or the learner is gonna uh, observe a certain object by rotating it around. And uh, by rotation, basically, you're getting different views for that object. All right, before I jump into this paradigm, uh, let me explain you some of the differences in the way I'm describing incremental learning and the batch learning setting. So one major difference is that I'm dealing with instance learning problems, so it's a specific object rather than a category learning problem. So it's gonna be a specific giraffe and not like the whole category of giraffes. And the reason why we wanted to do that is uh, well known in developmental psychology that children learn instances before categories. So they know that this is my toy truck, right? But they are not able to recognize like a toy truck outside, or oh, not a toy truck, but like a different toy truck or a truck itself, right? And uh, as their vocabulary sizes increase, they are able to generalize. So, so I think uh, currently in our paradigm, we want to tac tackle the instance learning problem first. Uh, the other thing is like the same rotation of an instance is only seen once as you go along in time. But in batch learning, you would see the same sample over multiple epochs, even uh, uh, albeit that they would be augmented and might look slightly different. Uh, batches also, in our case, as I showed before, here, if you take a batch out of here, it would all be for a single instance. Whereas the typical discriminative classifiers we learn have uh, batches which, uh, which contain samples from multiple classes. The other thing, as I started my talk, I talked about this, that uh, the learner in this case basically does not know how many classes or how many instances it would see over time. So it needs to increase its capacity to learn uh, the instances over time. Whereas uh, in batch setting, you all typically, you know, like, oh, ImageNet, okay, a thousand categories, that's all I need to learn. And, uh, oh, 
and our, oops, sorry, let me go back. Uh, and we also know that it's going to be a temporal sequence of images, whereas in a batch setting, it's uh, identically and independently distributed over the distribution of your training set. All right, so, so now that we want to tackle this problem, we went around and looked for data sets. Uh, we are not the first ones to do incremental learning, of course, uh, and a lot of people use CIFAR for their experiments and uh, which, of course, is not temporal information. Uh, then there's this new data set called Core E50, uh, which is video sequences, but it's over categories. Uh, so, so I think all of these data sets have certain problems like, so for instance, COIL is only 100 categories and we can't grow those set of, uh, or we can't grow those set of instances, I should say. Uh, ShapeNet is very nice in the sense that it gives you a lot of object models, but then the problem is that you, uh, the, it's basically just category level information and we don't have uh, more fine grained control over that API. So we went around and we built this data set, we call it crib, uh, that the child is in the crib and it's trying to learn about these objects. And the nice thing is that it's instances uh, we have, it's built synthetically so we can generate as many samples as we want and uh, we are gonna distribute like a nice API that you can play around with uh, which can do different things like you want temporally continuously long sequences of a single object or you want to track what part of the object has been exposed. So Crib allows you to do that. And on top of bounding boxes, you can get any sort of annotations, like you want optical flow, you want segmentations, we can get that. That's pretty straightforward. All right, so what does the data set look like? So uh, this is just, uh, I think these are about 70 objects or something. Um, there's a large variety, but we were trying to keep it as close to toys as possible because that's the environment we are trying to mimic. And uh, the way we generate each learning exposure that I talked about before is basically what you do is keep, keep a, take a static camera and rotate the object around it. Uh, so you can, as the object rotates, you can generate samples uh, or, or views for this object and over this whole, whole view, you can also generate some sort of camera path over your background. And what you get is a composite. When you take those together, you can get a composite which looks like something like this. And for every frame, we're gonna be getting like bounding boxes or segmentations. We can also get that. All right. Uh, okay. All right, these are multiple samples. And go forward, okay. All right, so, uh, so we didn't invest too much time in building some methods. So we're gonna take some different methods that are already out there. Uh, one method I would like to talk about is this learning without forgetting, which has, uh, which basically what it does is that you take some learning exposure, push it through the network, and it can learn using some standard binary cross entropy uh, about that object. But when a new object comes along, you want to first attach a new uh, neuron to predict for that object using the same sort of loss. But what happens, what do you do for the old uh, neuron? You basically apply a distillation loss, which is a simple way of saying it is that you are trying to, whatever you were saying for this previous neuron, you should keep saying that you should still maintain the same output for that neuron before you train for this, uh, before you train for this new object. Uh, another method we tried is this ICAR, which is fairly similar to uh, LWF in its base, but it uses this uh, idea of exemplar, so it keeps giving us uh, a sequence of samples, it keeps like some, some samples from them as exemplars. Uh, and those exemplars are also used for in the loss itself. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out, like unlike learning without forgetting, which is gonna classify using these output neurons, iCarl uses exemplar space to uh, classify uh, the objects that are coming so, in. So, so in this setting, you, you, you do know that when uh, uh, the object and the new object is uh, yes. Model. Yes. You, you don't need to discover whether this is a new object or the known uh, thing. Right. So, so in one setting, that is true. 
but in the setting I'm sure at the end, it is not true. So I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, so in the setting that you were talking about, you definitely know the labels for each object coming in, right? Okay, and this is, and the only difference as compared to, let's say, a completely supervised setting is that you don't know how many objects you would see over time. All right, so let me show you some graphs. Uh, all right, uh, so what you have on the y-axis is the test accuracy accumulated over all the objects seen till this point, right? And uh, the purple line, or the pink line, purple, okay, is basically showing how many unique objects that the learner has seen over time. Uh, and I would say this is an interesting setting because most of the people who are doing incremental learning right now are not dealing with a problem that you can repeatedly get the same object over time, which I think is really important because uh, you can argue that objects which are not seen again, why do you even need to recognize them, right? So, so for children, it's really important that uh, as they see like a toy again and again, its classification performance or, or its ability to recognize that object should improve over time. All right, so this is learning without forgetting. You can see that catastrophic forgetting is happening. Uh, but when we look at ICAR, uh, which is trained with scratch weights and with a distillation loss, you can see after at about 70 number, num about 70 learning exposures, it's able to start improving its representation, uh, its, uh, its classification performance. And the reason why that happens is that uh, I think it's because it's over time, it's able to improve its feature representation, which improves its ability to keep exemplars, uh, better exemplars in its, uh, in its exemplar space. And uh, one thing we did try on top of that is that let's say we take ICAR, scratch weights, but we don't do any distillation. Uh, what I mean by that, and it's, I think it's interesting, is that uh, you can, you can force uh, ICAR to, rather than use distillation loss over its exemplar space, you can use its actual labels to train for that model. So rather than asking the network, for instance, to make the same, so let's say you built a representation for a certain object, you were making mistakes on it, and distillation would force you to keep making those same mistakes, right? But the point is that when you have exemplars, right, you know the labels of those exemplars. Just use those labels for exemplars rather than, rather than training for distillation. And that definitely improves performance uh, significantly in this case. Yeah, go ahead. Why did you stop at 200 learning exposures? That seems like a small number. Like, yeah, we see that you start going back up around 60 or 70, which is great, but does it start going back down at 210? That's a good question. So I, I, we don't know that yet. This experiments take a lot of time to run, and we wanted to run it over multiple times to get these error bars also. Okay. So this was just an expedient choice for submitting the paper to ECCV. But we are running the experiment where we are going to, we are not only trying for 50, we are trying for 200 objects, and we are also extending the time scale to see what happens over, over time. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Another thing I think the community is not discussing, I, I don't know why, but let's say you take pre-trained weights from ImageNet, right? As in, that's a reasonable suggestion. It's not like the child would come in and would learn an edge detector from, from the toys it's seeing, right? But I think there's an open question like how much weight or how much entropy should you allow in the network when it's coming, to, uh, coming in this paradigm? Uh, anyways, we tried this pre-trained weights with no distillation. It performs the best over all of these, and it's sort of expected. The reason it is actually, uh, what we heard is, if you pre-train, the people say, "Well, your comparison is not uh, is not uh, fair." Right. So because, because the early papers they did not pre-train. Yeah, I think so like you pre So that, that's <laughs> one problem. I yeah, that's that's one problem. So in our paper, that's why we did scratch training so people can compare it to uh, their old papers. But I think we need to really think about what happens when there is pre-training. Because sure. we, yeah. we will, even like a child which is coming into an environment, would have some sort of uh, learning done beforehand, right? OK, so, so the nice thing about a synthetic uh, data generation pipeline is that uh, you can keep track what is happening over your exemplars. 
like as in you can keep track what pose of objects you are maintaining over time. So what you will see as I play this animation is that the test accuracy would come down here uh, and let me start playing it. So, so this blue dot is telling you the accuracy of the current object at that learning exposure. So the cross here means that what was the accuracy of that object before you started training at this learning exposure and the dot is where it ended up after this learning exposure. And uh, the top row is the set of exemplars you stored before you started learning for this exposure. And this is the updated set of exemplars. So you can take note, like, as in you can look uh, at interesting things like, okay, so the exemplar space is now well distributed over uh, a variety of uh, lighting changes, which helps it improves the performance over time. And then uh, you can keep looking at it. Uh, let's see. So, so then you can also note how does the when does the performance increase, decrease, right? So, so one thing we notice, for instance, is that the performance decreases when uh, the variety of poses also decreases. So, so in your previous set of exemplars here, you could see like the bottom of the card more, right? Uh, but in the updated exemplars, you cannot see, I think, that variety of poses. Or for instance, when the performance also decreases when you lose some lighting variation in your exemplar set. And so as the time goes on, do you actually add new, <coughs> add new exemplars? Uh, no, so, so the number of exemplars, so, so that exemplar space, we are treating it as a fixed memory, right? Okay. So you only allow, I think in this experiment, 50, uh, I think we allow for 500 exemplars. So, so at the start, yeah. uh, each object is allowed more memory, right? But as okay. more, exam okay. more objects come in, You've got to make room for other objects, so exemplars. Budget, uh, budget yeah, so fixed budget. Yes, so it's a fixed budget uh, exemplar space. So as you go a long time, like the number of exemplars has decreased for each object too. But now, it, once you reach, I think about 50 or something, you are only storing like 10 exemplars per per object. I think it's the exemplars per object is also written at the top. Uh, but yeah, you can notice like in that previous example. Let me go back uh, that performance also increases when the number of pose variations also increases as compared to the previous exemplars. All right, uh, let me move on. Okay, so uh, as you mentioned before, uh, I, we wanted to see what happens in the case, which is very common for children, is that they go around and play with objects and they don't know the labels for them, right? So what really happens is, let's say, Billy picked up a giraffe, right? And then when it comes back to the same giraffe, it needs to recognize it's the same giraffe so it can improve the representation, feature representation of that giraffe over time, right? So uh, here's an example from, from Linda Smith's data set that uh, the child grabs this cow, but there is no caregiver or no parent telling the name of the cow, right? But the child is still free to you know, rotate the object and learn something about it. So in this setting, what I will do is that you will still get learning exposures, but you will get no labels, right? So uh, as you're getting learning exposures of these rotating objects, all you would know is that inside that learning exposure is the same object. That's all you know. Uh, so this learning exposure might be of a certain instance, but this might be of the same instance or a new instance or so on. And, and the learner always needs to decide this over time that am I seeing a new object or am I seeing an old object, right? All right, so, so just to clarify that, let me, let me put, uh, display an example. So at the bottom, you're seeing the ground truth labels that are coming over for the learner, right? And these are the learner's symbols as symbols it is building over time, right? Uh, and by the way, the learner has no idea that this is object one. So it's, let's say, object alpha for, for the learner, right? So it no, does not know it's a giraffe or something, right? So in comes another label, it's correct, okay. So it learned to distinguish this one from this uh, one. 
but now it can make mistakes like it got a new object instance, but it assigned an old label to it, right? It said, oh, this is the same as the previous one. Uh, other mistakes it can make is that it saw an old instance, like it saw object two again, but it assigned it to a completely different label, right? So it's a misclassification. Or the third kind of uh, error that you can make is that let's say you saw an old instance, but you completely thought that, oh, this is not an object I've seen before, so I'll assign it a new label. So these are the sort of mistakes that a classifier here can make. Right, so just to clarify, uh, every a learning exposure, the, the learning algorithm needs to make a decision whether I have seen this object instance before or not. Right, so it needs to do the C plus one categorization. All right, so uh, we modified iCarl in a very, very simple way. Uh, it's just a baseline method, nothing fancy. So, and by the way, we are calling this problem that I just described as self-directed learning. So what we do is that once you get a learning exposure, you project it into the exemplar space and see whether those samples are close to a certain, certain mean exemplar in that exemplar space for all the objects you have seen till this point. So for instance, if this, uh, exam uh, if this sample falls closer to these green objects under a certain threshold which is picked empirically, uh, you assign it to that object. <coughs> it's fairly simple, <coughs> nothing fancy. All right, so here are the results. Uh, the, the method we are trying here is the best method from the previous experiment, which is ICAR with pre-trained weights and no distillation. Uh, so what you are seeing is the cumulative accuracy of the classifier as it goes along time. Uh, a normal question, uh, uh, a question that is asked frequently is that how am I even checking for accuracy, right? Because the classifier has its own label set and the label set that it's being trained on is like completely unknown to the classifier. So from the label set we do by once the training has ended, we do some bipartite matching to check uh, which label was actually mostly associated to what, uh, what object instance. It's like saying that uh, Billy played with his objects and once you ask it like, oh, what is this object to you? It says like, oh, this is object alpha. And then you realize, okay, object alpha to that learner is giraffe really. Uh, the other thing you're seeing is, of course, uh, the total number of objects seen, which is just the ground truth, and the objects created over time by the learner uh, is this, this blue line, I think. All right, so, so you can also analyze the different sort of uh, errors as the learner goes along, and uh, one sort of error that is dominant is uh, this misclassification error. Uh, one thing we noticed, like the, the algorithm we made stopped making like these uh, type one and type two errors, which are old object, new label, or new object, old label. Uh, it makes sense that this type two error, which is new object, old label would stop once you start introducing new objects, right? There is no opportunity for it to make old labels out of new objects because it's not seeing new objects anyways. But even apart from that, it stops making new labels out of old objects the most of the mistakes is basically misclassification. All right, so uh, conclusions from this part, uh, I would say uh, I think synthetic uh, data generation is the right way to go forward right now to explore this incremental learning pipeline because it allows you to you know, add new objects, create whatever sort of learning sequences you want out of it, uh, and it's, uh, it's very, very extensible and you can get segmentations or whatever you like. Or you can get labeling in whatever uh, way you like. And uh, as you saw, uh, one thing we saw is that even when you compare synthetic data generation to real world, uh, real world images, we are able to do some crossword learning there too. So if you're interested, I can show you some results there too. Uh, the other thing uh, is that when you are doing these repeated exposure sort of experiments, catastrophic forgetting is not that significant of an issue if you are allowed to keep exemplars. And uh, I would say exemplars is like an expedient choice if you have a limited memory system, but I think we need to think more about how do you incorporate memory 
in directly into the network. So, so we are also thinking about how to use memory networks, for instance, for this problem. Uh, another thing we saw, I think, is that distillation loss is not effective in this in this paradigm because you also know the labels of the exemplars. Uh, but that said, I think distillation loss is still interesting where you are dealing with completely different problems over time. So if you have a robot which is going out and it's ironing and then driving a car and so on, their distillation loss still makes sense. All right, I will like to acknowledge my thesis advisor, uh, Stefan, who is a PhD student uh, in our group, who was uh, leading a lot of the effort on, uh, on incremental learning. And then we have been collaborating with Linda Smith and Chen Yu and some undergrads and master's students who have been working with us. All right, uh, I think I am done. And here's a video for you. Hi, thanks. Some more questions? Some questions? Okay, all right. thanks, Ahmed. All right, cool, thanks. Thanks for coming to my talk.